Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. This video was actually the winner on the poll for May over on my Patreon. So go join the Patreon if you're interested in participating in the monthly polls. You also get uncensored videos, and then everybody gets monthly Netflix parties with me and lots of other stuff. All right, let's get right into it. Today we are talking about the murder of Kevin Bacon. A lot of you guys probably remember this case as it only happened just a couple years ago. I myself definitely remember when the news hit with this story as it was just absolutely devastating. And I just remember feeling very bad, especially for the LGBTQ plus community, because I mean, it, I think it really made people scared to use dating apps or at least definitely more cautious than before. And I think especially in the LGBTQ plus community, they are particularly at risk for crimes. And so, I don't know, I just remember this story just blowing up and scaring us all and also just being horrifying. Kevin Richardson Bacon was born on November 28th, 1994 in Lansing, Michigan to Carl and Pamela Bacon. He went to Swartz Creek High School, and then he went to Sharps Hair Academy in Grand Blanc. And at the time of his death, he was also a student at the University of Michigan in Flint. He was studying psychology. While he was in school, he was also a hairstylist. He worked at the Uniquely You Salon in Swartz Creek. He was very passionate about the art of hair and makeup, and you could tell just by looking at him. In some pictures, he does have his makeup done, and then in other pictures, you can tell even though he's partially bald, his hair is always this really pretty color, often pink in most of the pictures I've seen, which just shows you how passionate he was about this. He also had two cats named Smokey and Fuzzy. I know that's not super relevant to the story or anything, but I really wanted to mention it because he also had a dog named Hannah. So I had to include it. The consensus about Kevin from pretty much everybody who was asked was just that he was a very kind person. He cared about everybody that he came into contact with and he was just compassionate. People said that he was just always smiling and that he was just unapologetically himself. After his death, his best friend actually commented about him and the, how the nature of his death was just extra tragic because Kevin, according to her, just wanted to feel loved and he was really working on loving himself. So as you've probably deduced by now, Kevin was very young. He was only 25 years old when his life was so unjustly stolen from him. It was the evening of December 24th, 2019. That's right, it was Christmas Eve, and that was the last time anyone would see Kevin alive. Michelle Myers was not only Kevin's best friend, but also his roommate. That evening, Kevin told Michelle that he was going to go out and meet a man that he met on Grindr. If you don't know what Grindr is, it's a dating app that was originally made primarily for men who wanted to meet other men. I believe it's not specific to like cis gay men anymore. I think that's primarily what it was at the start. I think the app has branched out to other members of the LGBTQ plus community later in the later years and more recently. Not relevant to the story, just wanted to say that that app is very widely used in the community. Kevin told Michelle he was leaving. He left their place at about 5 p.m. that night. So then Michelle received some texts from Kevin a little over an hour later at 6.12 p.m. The texts read, okay, well, I'm going to be out for a while, actually. This is going to be fun. He's inviting more men. Not sure when I'll be back. Probably will be out late. So if mom calls you, I'm sleeping. Ha ha. And she replied to him, okay, that's fine laughing emojis. A lot of people in this case wonder if this could have been prevented if Kevin had told Michelle or somebody else who it was that he was meeting, where they were meeting, etc. And even the parents came out and said that later, like this should be a, you know, a cautionary tale for people meeting strangers on the internet. Make sure somebody always knows where you are and everything. And while I totally agree with that sentiment, I disagree with the fact that that would have changed anything. I don't think that would have saved Kevin's life. The reason for that will become pretty clear. 
So before we get into the actual murder, let's talk about Mark Latunsky. Mark is the main suspect in this case who is going to go on trial for Kevin's murder. Mark was 50 years old at the time, so he was twice Kevin's age, and he had quite a few mental illnesses as well as a rap sheet. So let's talk about his mental health first. He was being treated with medication, prescription medication for his various illnesses, but unfortunately, Mark was known for just randomly going off his medication and he would just stop taking it. And as most of us know, if you're being prescribed medication, especially for mental health, that's a huge no-no. Mark's ex-wife, with whom Mark had four children with, said that he had been diagnosed with major depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and had other traits of personality disorders. Mark and this ex-wife got divorced in 2013. A couple months later, in September of that same year after they got divorced, Mark was arrested for kidnapping two of their four children. He had apparently kept them in a hotel and refused to return them to mom. However, Mark got off from this crime scot-free, essentially. He was deemed incompetent to stand trial due to his mental state, and instead he was only sentenced to outpatient treatment in 2014. So he served no time for this. So then we have Jamie Arnold. Jamie Arnold is Mark's current husband. However, they had been separated for a few months when the murder occurred. So this is several years later in the kidnapping charge. Jamie and Mark got married around 2016, and then they were together through almost all of 20. 19. Jamie didn't know that Mark had all of these mental health issues until he was arrested again, this time for not paying child support to his ex-wife for their four children. Before this happened, Jamie had no idea and Mark hid his mental illnesses very well. Jamie didn't know until he was arrested and this all came out. This was July 2019. However, earlier that year, Jamie was starting to get suspicious that something was off with Mark. In February, Mark got fired from his job for erratic behavior. And then Mark was saying very nonsensical things as the months went on. He was saying things to Jamie like his children with his ex-wife weren't even his. And then also stating to Jamie that he was sure their neighbors were polluting their water supply and trying to poison them. It was believed that he he was off his medication at this time, and I am no expert, but that sure does sound to me like delusions from paranoid schizophrenia. Jamie, at this point, I mean, I think the getting arrested for the not paying child support was kind of Jamie's last straw. He was kind of starting to get scared of Mike, knew that he had to get out of this situation, and the two separated, but are not divorced as far as I know, but the two separated in September of 2019. So fast forward to October 10th, 2019, about a month later. 911 receives a call from a man who claims to have just escaped from Mark's basement. The two had met at the bus station in Flint, Michigan, and we assume that they also met on Grindr. They went to the store, and at some point, Mark drugged the man, and the man went unconscious and just woke up in Mark's basement. He actually was able to escape. He was like tied up on leather or something, and there was a knife close by, and so it was pretty easy for him to escape. But then he's running away from the house, and he's calling 911, scared and frantic. So he didn't even know Mark's name and he ended up not pressing charges. He told authorities he didn't want to pursue charges, he just wanted to go home. I'll play part of the 911 call for you. It's very long, so I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's a little hard to understand as well, so I will play kind of the highlights of it. Hey, Lassie, 911, where is your emergency? Um, this is going to sound insane. Um, I'm here in Detroit. I'm from New York, and I met this guy at the bus station who offered me a ride, and I'm not even sure where I am, but I broke out of this fucking basement, and I need a ride. Okay. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I can't find my way back to his place if I wanted to. Um, I don't know if you can take me a signal. I'm from New York. I'm walking down the street with a picture of my sweetheart. I need help. Okay, I'm going to get you help. Are you walking down the street right now? Yes, ma'am, I am. 
I'm passing it on. It's all beautiful here. Okay. And I can't believe her. I don't know where I am. I don't, I don't know. Like, I never ever had anything like this happen. I don't know whether he drugged me. I don't know. I woke up in a fucking basement, okay? Chained in a basement with a leather thing on my an ankle, and I cut it with the butcher knife that I have in my freaking hand. Excuse my French. Okay. Do you have I anything have on you right now? Um, I have my phone. I'm sorry, what? Are you carrying anything? A uh, uh, butcher knife. Until I see a police officer. When I see a police officer, I will throw it. I just want to get out of here, and I want to go home. I don't even care about the legal case I was here for. I'm sorry I can't help them. I want to go home. Okay. All right. And listen, I've got help on the way. What were you here for? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a volunteer court advocate. I came here to help on the CSC meeting. And I was supposed to be meeting them at the bus station. I met this guy. I'm by. He was cute. He hit on me. I know. We went out to the car. We dropped. Uh, we went to the store. I had a soda. I woke up in the basement. Okay. He obviously drugged me. Okay, when I get a trooper close to you, I'm going to need you to put that butcher knife down, though. Oh, that's not an issue, sweetie. We're about flying into the woods. Okay. Your officer is in no danger. I've been a public You don't need to throw it in the years. woods, but, but I just don't want it on you. Is there anything else on you at all? So later, it's even reported that, that this man, this, he's anonymous. We don't know who this man is even returned to Mark's house after this incident and returned for several more days. Very, very odd. I don't think we'll ever really know why. And I think because of that, the police couldn't do anything. If he said no crime occurred, what are the police gonna do? But then on November 25th, 2019, again, just a little over a month later, yet another different man calls 911 with a very similar story. He said to the dispatcher that he had just escaped a man's home where he had been tied up. He's running up and down the streets wearing nothing but a kilt. And during the 911 call, Mark is kind of behind, but chasing after him. The man is trying to find somebody in their home to let him in or call the police for him. Somebody finally does, but people obviously were really scared and didn't want to let him in. This half-naked man banging on their door and begging for help does scare people, but somebody did eventually call 911 as well, but he was already on the phone with 911. But right as the man caught up to this poor victim, police did finally show up. You escaped from some guy who had me chained up in his basement. He had you chained in his basement? Where are you calling from? I don't know. Did he have to be? Hey, Z, I need you to go to somewhere safe. If you can run up to somebody's house. The dispatcher later identifies the man's location over the phone and sends troopers there. Are you in the road? I have some state troopers that aren't very far away. I see the trooper right there. He just, yeah. When police arrived, Mark told them and convinced the police that he was just trying to get his kilt back. The man, the victim, was wearing a $300 leather kilt of Mark's and Mark convinced him that he was only chasing after him because he stole his kilt. He just wanted it back and he would let him go. He wasn't doing anything to him. This man was 29 years old and he also did not press any charges against Mark for this incident. I don't know why again, but I can only imagine since I don't think he returned to Mark, I think it was just out of fear. Sometimes you just don't wanna deal with the legal proceedings of this. You weren't harmed in the end. I mean, you were emotionally harmed, but you weren't physically harmed. So I can only imagine that the man just like the other one just wanted to go home and didn't wanna deal with it anymore. However, these two incidents leading up to Kevin Bacon's murder are important. It does show a pattern. It does show that Mark kind of had an MO and it's very reminiscent to a lot of people of a victim of Jeffrey Dahmer. There was a 14 year old victim of Jeffrey Dahmer who was trapped in his apartment, but was able to escape. He was, I mean, really in bad shape, all bloodied up and bruised. Three women found him and took him, helped him find the police and they all went to the police. But the police returned the 14 year old boy to Jeffrey Dahmer's home. And Jeffrey Dahmer convinced the police that the boy was actually 19 years old and it was his boyfriend. In spite of the fact that the woman who were helping the boy protested and said, this is not right. He can't go back to him. He's in danger. Police 
returned the boy into Jeffrey Dahmer's home, claiming that they didn't want to get in the middle of a domestic squabble between homosexuals. This 14-year-old boy was Dahmer's next victim and was killed within an hour of being returned to him from the police. Now, I don't think that Mark is exactly like this because I think that boy, if he did get the opportunity to get away. I think it was the police's direct fault. I think in Mark's case, I think these men said they didn't want to press charges, ended up telling the police it was just a fight and that it was consensual in the end. So I don't know what else police could have done in that situation because according to the victim, no crime had actually been committed. So what are they going to do if they don't want to press charges? However, I do have to say this is a pattern in crime in our community. There's warning signs like this. This is a clear pattern. This man had mental health issues, had been arrested in the past, and was off his medication, and this had happened twice. And if either of those men had pursued charges, I'm not blaming them. Never blame them. They're still victims because we don't know what we would do in that situation. However, this maybe could have been, Kevin's death maybe could have been prevented if the police pressed harder or if they were somehow able to stop this. I do think we need a better system for preventing crimes and not just being like, well, we can't do anything until they actually kill someone. So sorry. Anyway, that is the guy who has admitted to killing Kevin Bacon. So this is what happened to Kevin. On Christmas Eve, as we talked about, Kevin went to go meet up with Mark. He texted Michelle around 6, 12 p.m. to let her know that he was having fun and not to wait up for him. But the next morning on Christmas Day, Kevin was supposed to go to his family's house pretty early that morning to have Christmas breakfast with everybody. He didn't show up. Later that day, his parents called police. Police quickly found Kevin's car at a family dollar in Clayton Township. Inside the car was Kevin's phone, his wallet, and his clothes, which if you know anything about true crime, finding a victim's car without them in it, let alone finding it with all their belongings in it, is never a good sign. Clayton Township Police called the Michigan State Police to ask them if they would help, and they, you know, of course said yes, so now there's multiple police departments working on this case. It was assumed at this point, finding all of his stuff in the car, that it was very likely Kevin was either in very grave danger or no longer alive. It wasn't until December 28th, a few days later, when authorities finally tracked down Mark Latunsky. Some Facebook posts about Mark Latunsky's house was apparently forwarded on to the investigators, which prompted them to go talk to Mark. Mark willingly let the officers into their home when asked if they could search, was just like, yeah, sure come on in and police officers came in and searched the home. Sure enough, authorities quickly found Kevin's body in Mark's house. Another quick trigger warning, I'm about to go over the very gruesome part of this case. This is the details of what happened to Kevin. If you would prefer not to hear them, please skip ahead, they are disturbing. They found Kevin in a secret room in Latunsky's basement. They found Kevin hanging upside down and naked from the ceiling rafters. So when Mark confessed, they later found out what happened. Apparently when Kevin was in his home, Mark stabbed Kevin in the back once. He then cut Kevin's throat and this is what we believe killed him. After his death, Mark said that he tied Kevin's ankles up and hung him from the ceiling. He later then removed Kevin's testicles and ate them. This is why a lot of people refer to this case as the grinder cannibal. They believe this all went down on Christmas Eve or in the very early hours of Christmas morning. As I said before, that's why I don't think that if he had told anybody where he was, it would have made any difference because the person that he did tell said he was going to be out super late. If he was out all night, she wasn't going to worry about him anyway. So I just don't think that there was some magical thing he could have done to prevent this. I just find that a weird, like, it's not victim blamey because I know people are just trying to help others and just make sure others are safe and to not meet strangers without meeting in a public place and telling people where they're going and stuff. 
but I think these kind of hookups are very common in any dating scene, any circle dating scene. I know in me, cis straight people, I know that I have a lot of friends that have casual dating like this. And I think that that's just a very normal part of my generation. So I don't think anybody should blame Kevin or say that he should have done this or that because I just, I don't think there was anything he could do. I think that he was just very unlucky. Anyway, Mark, of course, was quickly arrested and charged with open murder and mutilation of a corpse. Open murder is something specific to Michigan, apparently. I didn't know this until researching for this case. It just means that the prosecutor doesn't have to choose between first and second degree murder, like during the charges and during the trial, and they basically leave it up to the jury to decide based on the trial and based on the evidence. Mark at first was actually mentally evaluated and it was at first decided that he was incompetent to stand trial. Obviously, Mark was not mentally well. He was, you know, diagnosed with mental health issues as we discussed earlier. However, Kevin's parents justly believe that Mark is just using the mental health illness card as a pawn to try and get off. They believe since it's helped him get out of legal trouble in the past, like with the kidnapping case, he was incompetent and therefore just got outpatient treatment instead of prison time, that's what he's trying to do here. Mark had apparently told his public defender that he was from a family called the Thomas clan, that this was a royal family out of Wales and that his name was actually Edgar Thomas Hill. So many people, including Kevin's parents, believe that he's playing up his mental illness in order to make his insanity plea more convincing or to not be able to stand trial at all. And I actually don't blame them for thinking that at all because it would make sense that he would try to use it. Especially because if you remember, Jamie, his husband or ex-husband now, said that Mark was very good at hiding his illness from him and that he had no idea for years that he had a mental illness at all. And if he was that good at hiding it and it was that intentional, it just seems weird that all of a sudden he's calling himself a different name and all this other stuff. Like he's trying to intentionally make people believe that he is insane. But on the other hand, the thing that does make me wonder is that when police officers came to his door, he willingly let them in. They asked if they could search his home and he was just like, okay, sure, come on in without a warrant or anything like that, knowing that Kevin's body was in his basement. I have never heard of a killer willingly letting law enforcement into their home without at least even a feeble attempt of trying to hide evidence of what they did. It just seems to me like if he was in his right mind, if he understood that what he did was wrong, I think he would have tried to hide it from officers and he didn't. Of course, I'm not an expert, it's all speculation and we'll let the courts decide. Either way, his lawyer is planning on submitting a not guilty plea for reason of insanity. If he can get away with that, Mark will be put into a hospital. Kevin's family, even though they don't believe that he was insane at the time of the murder, they honestly just want him to be locked away for life either way, however that's done, because they just don't want him to be able to hurt anybody else. So then another weird thing that came out of this case so far is that Mark's lawyer also tried to claim that the two of them had a suicide pact and that in Kevin's autopsy, they found a uh, antidepressant in his autopsy and therefore Kevin could have been suicidal and he had asked Mark to help him die. This argument was thankfully quickly debunked. As we know, just because you're taking antidepressants, as many of us are, does not make you suicidal. And second, texts between Mark and Kevin before they met up proved this to be completely false. Kevin told Mark in text before they met up that if they were to have a sexual encounter, he wanted Mark to promise him that he would be safe. It sounds to me like they were discussing the dynamics and boundaries of a BDSM date and that Kevin was setting up his boundaries with Mark. I don't know that for sure, but that's just what it sounds like to me. So there's no way that there was some sort of weird death pact or that he was consensually killing Kevin because Kevin previously told him before they met up that that is not what was happening. Anyway, 
Mark was recently found competent to stand trial, and as of just a few days ago, it was announced that his trial will start this fall. He's going to have his plea hearing on October 13th of this year in 2022, and I assume that he will submit the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, and then his trial is going to start on October 18th. And that's where his case stands today. We don't know anything yet or what's going to happen to Mark. I do just want to take a moment to remind everybody that just because some Somebody has a mental illness, especially paranoid schizophrenia, does not mean that they're violent. Most people with paranoid schizophrenia are actually never violent towards other people, in spite of what the media and the movies often tell us. I just want to say that, because if Mark is found to have done this and was influenced by his schizophrenic delusions, I don't want it to add to this stereotype of people with schizophrenic disorders that all these stereotypes they already have to live with and people being scared of them is a big one. I just want everybody to remember that generally you don't have to be afraid of mentally ill people. Most of the time they are bigger risk to themselves than they are to other people. It just seems like it's a lot of them because A, the media, and B, that's the this is the type of case we hear of on the news and it ignores all the people with the same mental illnesses that are totally kind, normal, nonviolent people. Okay, just to get that out there. So that was the extremely tragic case of Kevin Bacon. I kind of wanted to do this story for a while. I always just found it, I wanted the dust to settle around it some, but I just found it very particularly tragic that just something so nightmarish happened to somebody. And even though the details of his death are out there and out in the media, and we even talked about them here for the sake of the story, his family especially wants everybody to remember Kevin for who he was and the good person that he was, and to please try to not remember him the way he was found. That being said, that is gonna be it for today. Please leave this video a like just to support the channel, not because the story is nice, and I will see everybody in the next video video. A special thank you to all my patrons, especially top tiers, Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, JJ, Dirty Kitty, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Whimsicott Fan, Delta Wolf 776, Mitchell Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Dark Sided Otter, Brittany Phillips, JB Funk, and our newest Willow Winchester.